We're doing a series called Family Matters, and uh, it's an important series because families do matter, don't they? Uh, For those of you who were not aware, Skylar already mentioned it, today is Valentine's Day. That's February 14th. You should have had it on your calendar, husbands. Wives like to be remembered on Valentine's Day. Today is the day that we're supposed to remember that someone special in our life It's a day filled with candy and flowers, and don't forget that special Valentine's card with all those mushy little words in it, right? Don't forget that, guys. If you need to stop at Walgreens on the way home, the pickings are slim for the cards, but you still might get a few, so you might have to get some that have an ethnic flair, who knows, but you're going to have to bring home a card, okay, guys? So just... Giving you a little warning there. Uh, I was going to take my wife today uh, as a surprise to the top of the Empire State Building to be really romantic, but she's not, she's not feeling well, so she's on the mend. I'll have to do that another time. Anyway, getting back to uh, what we're talking about, you know, some people think that Valentine's Day is a little over the top. It's a Hallmark holiday, they call it. Uh, but you really think about this. You can never show too much love. One of the things that should be the hallmark in every family is that the family is a place. It's a refuge where there's no shortage of love. And we're going to be touching on that a little bit today. Uh, Today, as we continue in our series, we're going to explore a number of important qualities of healthy families. Last week, we talked about the importance of husbands and fathers in setting the tone, providing leadership and direction. If you have a handout, you can fill in these little blanks there. Uh, That's one of the things that uh, God has given and entrusted to men is to lead their homes. There's no getting around it that uh, the reason for the dissolution of our families is in large part due to the absence of strong men. And so I'm saying that uh, as a strong Um, challenge as an admonition and for some of us a rebuke because as men we need to step it up we need to do a better job Uh, but uh, I don't want to say that in a in a condemnatory thing I think that we can do better and I think that by God's grace we will Uh, but today we're going to focus on those of the female persuasion and uh, what would our world look like without women right women add such beauty and grace to our dreary world. And as we talked about the importance of men for families to function well, we cannot forget how much women can change the atmosphere and the whole landscape of a home. I think God knew uh, that Adam needed someone to balance him out. Guys can be sort of rough around the edges, And women, uh, well, these are generalizations, of course, but women tend to soften the abrasive tendencies in men. I've often said that guys are sort of like cavemen, and when women come into their lives, they kind of, they make them more civilized, and it's a good thing. Us guys need to be civilized uh, so that we don't uh, cut our toenails at the coffee table and... uh, You know, anyway, we won't talk about all of the uncouth uh, little habits that we have, but women do tend to civilize us. The truth is, if we're really honest, men, is we desperately need godly women in our homes. And that's the operative word, is godly women. Where would we be without women? So let's look at some of the important roles. I want us to look at the role of a woman because families are important. Each person in a family functions in different ways. And they've been, they've been called with responsibilities from God. And women play important roles in the marriage and in the home. And the, and the first is something that we touched on last week. Women are called to be followers. We talked about that in Ephesians, right? There's another passage in Colossians. Paul repeats, and he's very similar. He writes in the third chapter of Colossians. Look what he says in verse 18 here. He says, Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Now again, this is not a demeaning function or role that God has given you. Here's how it works. As a husband submits to Christ, 
surrendering his will to his Savior, the wife willingly submits to her husband. And she surrenders her will to his caring leadership. Did you get that? The husband submits to Christ, and he surrenders his will to the Savior. And the wife, she says, if he's going to do that, well, then I have no problem willingly submitting to my husband and surrendering my will to his caring leadership because he's, um, I know that he can be trusted because he has his priorities on straight and he's, uh, he's really got uh, his, his thinking right. You know, uh, that concept, it says that wives need to be submissive to their husbands. In, in Ephesians, it says, wives be submissive to your husbands as to the Lord. So I want you to understand, women, that this is not an absolute statement. There are some boundaries. There are some limitations. Submission is not an absolute thing like whatever I tell you to do, you have to do. You just be quiet and do it. That's not what God wants you to do. Because there are times where we walk out of the will of God. If your husband were to, were to ask you to do something that's sinful, well, then you aren't bound by the limitations of submitting to your husband if he's asking you to do something that is ungodly. So we understand that there aren't um, un, unbridled uh, leadership uh, roles to take advantage of you and exploit you. These are, these are really principles for following a man because he can be trusted, because he is first submitting to the Lord. Now, I know this, uh, this concept is difficult because I know some of you in this room. Women, some of you women, and I've met a lot of them, they're very strong. You're very capable. Some of you are very intelligent. Some of you Maybe I won't say it too loud. Under my breath, I might say some of you might be more intelligent than your husbands. But that's not really the issue. Okay? Um, I would encourage you, strong women, to just take a step back. And although it may be tempting, I want you to resist the urge to usurp your husband's leadership. Okay, I know it's hard because you're saying, well, I could do it better. <laughs> I know I could do it better. I mean, I, I mean, I'm watching the guy. But that's really where it really takes faith to say, I'm going to show faith in God. I'm going to trust God by entrusting this responsibility of leading my home, our home, to my husband. In fact, I think what... Um, would be good. You should, what you should be doing is encouraging. In fact, you strong women, you should be insisting that your husband lead. Don't let him off the hook. You need to be pushing him to be a leader in, in, a, in a good, positive way. You, you need to say, honey, I, I need you to make this decision. Okay? Those are, those are important things to help him develop and to grow. A lot of men, it's just easier. If a, if a woman is very strong, they say, well, we'll just let her do it. <laughs> I'm off the hook. I can just take a nap on the couch. That's not really uh, what makes a very strong, healthy, robust family. It's when everybody is working together. So that's an important thing. Uh, enough said about that, that uh, uh, topic. The second role of a wife uh, and again, these are not exhaustive, but the second role of a wife is to be a helpmate. If you go back to that passage in Genesis that we touched on last week in chapter 2, in verse 18, it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Every one of us could use a helper. The King James says, a help meet, someone to meet him at his point of need. Believe me, girls, us guys, we can use all the help we can get. And the good thing is that women are naturally wired to nurture. It's not a pejorative again. I don't want to be um, 
like putting everybody in a cast in a wide net and saying everybody's exactly the same. This can be, again, sounding like sort of a generalization. But overall, I do believe that this is true. Women are, I've seen it experientially, anecdotally, and I think that many of you would agree that women are better at nurturing than us guys. They're, they're just wonderful at being behind the scenes like that in this wonderful helper role. It's just a wonderful thing. It says, listen to this passage in Titus. Paul is instructing um, Titus to teach the older uh, women in the church about their responsibilities. And so he's telling Titus, this is what I want you to go tell the older women. He didn't want to have to deal with the older women. So he tells Titus, young Titus, you go tell the older women that this is what they're supposed to be doing, okay? And he says, older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good. So he you know, Paul is instructing Titus, go tell these older women they have a very important responsibility in setting the tone as a role model. And it goes on, look what it says in verse 4. It says, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands and to love their children. The older women are given this responsibility to act as an example to the younger women. They're, they're role models of what it looks like to be godly. And it really is generational. They should be. It says uh, they should avoid gossip at all cost. I mean, this is, this is such a critical thing that we demonstrate this and we show younger people how important it is for us to be able to maintain um, our, our focus on our family and not focus on everybody else and all the other little things that are going on. Uh, also, it says that they need to tell those women, you know, hey, we don't want you to be enslaved to much wine. I don't know if you got a lot of boozers out there. <laughs> but what he's talking about is, is, is these older women need to maintain this self-control. If you have older women who lack restraint or exhibit these addictive personalities, it's a very toxic influence to younger, much more impressionable women. This is a very important concept that how we are told how the older men and the older women need to be demonstrating and living out what godliness looks like. Because we don't want to be a stumbling block to the younger women and the younger men that are out there. So instead of, of, of having these negative characteristics, instead of that, what does he say in verse 4? They should be teachers passing along this moral wisdom to the next generation, right? And I, I have to ask, again, how are we doing? Based on the results, I have my doubts that we're really using this model of having older women mentoring younger women to be the kind of women that are going to be great at their role in the home. And I think that would be a really wonderful thing if some of the older women would say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some of these younger women under my wing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pour into them. I'm going to look for opportunities uh, not to lord over them, but to love on them and help them so that they can be prepared to be the kind of wives and the kind of mothers that they need to be. Uh, did you catch what it says, though, in that last verse? Uh, it says here in verse 4, it says, Women need to learn to be lovers. That's the second role. We can't emphasize this enough. Another role that women have in this family structure is to love. We need to be the ones that, that exude love. I'll tell you the best way that you can do that. You know the best way that you can promote this environment, this atmosphere of love in your home? I'll tell you how. The best way that you as women can love your husbands and your children, especially love your husbands, uh, is to trust him and to respect him. Now, I know that this might not make sense to you when I say this, if you're a woman, but men would rather be respected than be loved. I'm telling you, I'm a man. I can tell you this. 
Now, uh, that sounds like, obviously, I would like both. I want to be loved, and I want to be respected by my wife. But if I had to choose between the two, I would much rather be respected. That's how guys think. That's their value system. They want to know that their wife respects them, that their wife believes in them, their, life, their, their wife trusts them, she, that she honors his position and his role, someone that they um, have confidence in. And, and guess what? Here's the beautiful thing about it. If the wife loves her husband by showing him respect, he will respond by loving you. I know that this is, again, hard for men to understand, but if you love your wives like Christ loved the church, they'll have a lot easier time respecting you. So you see how it works? As wives respect and honor their husbands, their husbands respond by loving you in a way that is supernatural. And as you, as husbands, love your wives unconditionally and show them that kind of love that they're so desperately craving for, because I know that women would rather be loved than respected. <laughs> if you show them that love, guess what? They'll, they'll have no problem respecting you and honoring you and having confidence in you. So guys yearn for that. And the more that you show him respect, the more that he'll love you. And uh, which leads us to one more role here. You know, we, we want to be followers. We want to be help, helpers. We want to be lovers. And that comes in many forms, of course. We didn't really touch on them all. But one of the things that you can do that will make you an amazing wife. Some of you are thinking about getting married someday. Some of you are married. And some of you can relate to this because you've been married. But um, one of the things that will make you an absolutely astounding wife is you've, if you can embrace the role of a cheerleader. It kind of goes along with that thing we talked about, about respect, being a cheerleader. Look what it says in... Let, go, to, go to the book of Ephesians, um, Ephesians chapter 5, and look at the end of it. Um, let me get to it real quick. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33. It says here, Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. That's what we just talked about, right? Right? This thing about respect, um, as wives, we have the opportunity to help our husbands in a way that only we can do. We can become, um, uh, we can become their cheerleaders. I'm, we, I, I say that as, as if I'm one of them. <laughs> you can become a cheerleader to your husband. You're their number one fan. You're number one in their fan club. And you can help them to become the men that God intended them to be. I will tell you that what a wife uh, can do is absolutely one of the most powerful things. Uh, when a wife believes in her husband, and what a wife believes about her husband is more important than any other opinion that he's going to receive. If you all thought I was an idiot, but my wife thought I was wonderful, it would be okay. But if you all thought I was wonderful, but my wife thought I was an idiot, it would be devastating. I'll tell you, if you believe in your husband and you support him, that will go farther than any other words of encouragement that he will receive from any other source. I can guarantee it. You can be his greatest cheerleader. He will go to farther lengths because you believe in him. I'll tell you, you being a cheerleader, a cheerleader it, would really, it would really be probably one of the most beneficial, enriching things that he will ever experience in his marriage is to have someone who believes in him. It's like that song by Kenny Rogers, right? Where well, she believes in me, <laughs> right? There's no one else that uh, believes in, in me like my wife. Isn't that a wonderful thought? To have someone that you know is your ally. They're in your corner. They're never going to, 
They're never going to back out. They're never going to, you know, skedaddle on you. They're loyal to the end. Wow, I tell you, that's the kind of person you want fighting in the battle and fighting in the wars and in the skirmishes. And you will face some rough times. And it's great to have someone that you can call a teammate, someone that is a partner, someone that you can go through life with, and that person is going to be there for you. You see, women, you have a powerful role in the home that you don't even understand. And, um, you know, there, there are other things we're going to be talking about. Uh, we're going to be talking about another area at length that is this indispensable role that women have as mothers. Because eventually, you're not going to just be a wife. Eventually, if you get married, you'll, you'll have children. And um, that irreplaceable, uh, life-transforming responsibility of training up children. Remember, if this role is being, is being played out and men are being leaders and providers, providing for the, um, the financial needs of a home. And again, we really messed up our nuclear family by changing uh, the economic structure of our country where, where it, it almost feels like you have to have two people, two incomes to, to survive these days. But I'll tell you, if there's any way you can have a woman be able to stay home and be able to, to have the privilege and the honor of raising children and not have to work, that would be something that, if there would be one thing we could return to in this country, it would be to have a home where women can be mothers and truly be able to embrace that role of training up their children and investing in them instead of having the government train up our children. Instead of having schools train up our children. From an earlier and earlier and earlier age, we've got to have preschool programs now that the government runs. We've got to have it from the time, you're, the time you're done with your maternity leave so that you can go back to work and let somebody else raise your kids. Nobody will raise your kids as well as you will, and that's because nobody loves them like you do. Nobody knows them like you do. And not only that, if you're a believer, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have this other ingredient that you can add to your parenting, which is raising them up to be godly, to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Wow, that's incredible, the role that you play. And you're going to spend more time with your kids than your, your, the father is, generally speaking. You're going to be with them more, especially in the younger years. If they never go to school, you could homeschool them. Wouldn't that even be better? But the point is, is you have this invaluable, priceless position in the home as women. And we really want to honor you. We want to say that, you know, hooray for the women. And I, I, I would love to see women take that challenge to say, I want to be the kind of woman that God wants me to be in the home. And so that our family can continue uh, to be fostered and to be cultivated in the things of God. You know, I mentioned that thing and as we close. Um, what a wonderful thing it would be to raise your kids in a home that loves Jesus Christ and where your kids come to know Jesus as their Savior. There are so many people in this world that were brought up in a non-religious home, a, a home where God was not mentioned, a, a, a really a secular home where this whole issue of faith and belief was not even part of the equation. It was never brought up. And how tragic that is. Because that's the place where children need to find Jesus. And maybe you've missed out on that. Maybe you've grown up in a, in a place where you never really were brought up in, a, in an environment to hear about Jesus. But right now, you're right in the midst of it. You have the opportunity to hear about Jesus. Right at this moment, even though you might have missed it your whole life, you're staring right in the face of an opportunity. And here's the opportunity. You can have Jesus have a center role in your life. And it, 
is, it's really not hard. You can invite Jesus to be part of your life by simply putting your faith in him as your Savior. Isn't that a wonderful offer? Isn't that a, a beautiful thing that God says, listen, you know what? You might not have had God in your life when you were a little kid. You might not have had God in your life when you were an adolescent or when you were a teenager. You might have went through your whole uh, teenage, your college years, your single years without God. But it's never too late. I'm still here. Maybe you're, start, maybe you're a late bloomer. But guess what? You can begin a relationship with me right now. And it's really simple. We are sinners and that sin separates us from God. But if we will put our faith in Jesus Christ and believe he died on the cross for our sins, then guess what? God will wash away those sins. He will remove the wall of separation that is between us because Jesus paid the debt for your sins. And if you'll only believe in him and receive him as your Savior, why don't you do it today? You're listening out there. I know there's someone out there listening who is wondering, what is he talking about? This is the reason that you're listening. God wanted you to hear this, that you can be part of the family of God. Wouldn't you like to do, to do that today? Wouldn't you like to be a part of God's family? If you've never done it, today's the day. Today's the day. And uh, then, then you can see what other wonderful things God has what blessings he has in your life. But it all starts with beginning this new life in Christ, this promise of eternal life and a, and a guaranteed place in heaven. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to happen tonight? I pray that you do. And we're going to pray right now in Jesus' name. But Father God, thank you for everybody here. I thank you, Lord, for the family. We thank you, Lord, for every person in the family. They're each and every one of them essential. I pray, Lord, we would take our role seriously, that we would not undermine it or minimize it. I pray, Lord, that each and every one of us would look squarely in the mirror and ask ourselves, how can I improve the quality of what the results are in my home in raising godly children, cultivating a godly atmosphere, and bringing glory to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. I pray we would do this.